And so I'm going to talk about the exhibition. Um, it is from here that the world unfolds. This is the first exhibition that I've curated here at the museum um, as part of my newly hired role as senior curator. And this exhibition brings together contemporary, historical, and modern art, about 50 works from the Herman H. Levy collection. And so this project was recognized in, um, in recognition of the return of the collection to the museum after its tour. It was touring for about two years across Canada in an exhibition called A Cultivating Journey. And so that exhibition um, catalog is available at the front desk if you're interested in, in knowing more about that particular exhibition. There's an amazing range of essays. I think there's about eight es essays in that um, catalog. Amazing reproductions. And it really gives um, overview of Herman Levy, the collection, and how it relates to art historical discourse and beyond. And so um, the philanthropy of Herman Levy and his donations and bequests is what you partially see here. Um, between 1948 and 1990, Herman Levy, I would say, radically changed the scope of the collection through his donation, making this collection, one of the most significant collections within university art galleries in Canada for its valuation and the artists that are a part of this collection. And so um, Levy was interested in a broad range of areas from antiquities, historical maps to European historical prints. And he had a particular passion for modernism, realism, impressionism, and post-impressionist paintings. And his financial bequest, which came in um, 1990, held the stipulation that the acquisition of works be of, um, from outside of North America. So he had a particular stipulation, but not anything about any particular artists. Um, and that bequest was used to fill in gaps, to expand different aspects of the collection, add historical, modern, and also more contemporary works with the focus on European art. Um, and so for me, it was really a, a, an, a really amazing opportunity to get to know this collection, close to 500 pieces, um, and an amazing range to, 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 to really uh, curate from. And, you know, I was assigned the task and I, you know, new to the museum, didn't really know where to start, but I was looking through the publication and was struck by the question that was in the museum forward by Carol, our director, which asked, how does the museum collect in the 21st century? And that was a question that I started to think about and frame the exhibition around that idea. Like how can a collection that is focused primarily on the European canon maintain its relevance in a global framework? And how can a collection become an opportunity to really explore this idea of new mu museology and expanded curatorial practice? So as a curator, I'm really interested in, in what museums do, the role that we play in contemporary society. And so those were the, some of the issues that I was interested in exploring within this exhibition. And as I say, with the, um, with some of the supporting uh, texts around the show, one of the things that I talk about is that the museum is not a neutral space. Um, this idea that the, uh, the museum is this kind of ideological neutral space is something that I think that is being deconstructed in contemporary discourse. And many museums and art institutions, particularly within the Western capitals, are facing these complex reassessments of their holdings. 
and really responding to calls to return cultural artifacts that have been moved from their place of origin during war and colonial expansion. Um, still others attest that histo these historic objects belong to humanity as a whole, irrespective of where they're found. So it's, it's an ongoing debate of who is included in this idea of universality and also in this idea of, of humanity. Um, recently, in the past year or so, I was interested in a lot of the uh, press I had seen, particularly within Europe, um, when pre uh, French President Emmanuel Macron issued a report um, to change the heritage laws and return looted objects in French museums to African nations. The cultural minister of Jamaica called on the British Museum to return indigenous artifacts taken when the island was a British colony. Greece and Ethiopia had made similar calls to br the British Museum, and officials in Germany and the Netherlands are following suit with plans to return African art and artifacts to their, their place, original locations. Also, reports from UNESCO state that 90 to 95% of subheritage Sub-Saharan, sorry, cultural artifacts are housed outside of Africa, so 90 to 95 percent are not in their original locations, and so it becomes a point of contention. Um, even though I do feel that museums are important places to explore this dismantling of marginalizing narratives such as Eurocentrism, which negates the history, story, and importance of more than half of the globe in the name of the universal, which comparatively includes a privileged few. So I'm interested in this idea of um, how museums are beginning to rehang and rethink of how their collections are mounted within their spaces and broadening the narrative. And so this exhibition is really starting to delve into some of those questions and ideas. And so for me, I was interested in recentering this idea, this dominant narrative and to consider how we could talk about more inclusive histories and really look at fundamental change that is more than about representation, but about how we can correct the narrative, how we can facilitate more of a historical accuracy in recognizing our museums that are really, in actual fact, deeply shaped by colonialism. And so for me, as a curator, I really didn't want to claim this authoritative voice. I've, over the years, I've been very sensitive to this idea of hierarchy, especially working with artists. I don't like to come in as, OK, well, I'm going to pick this, 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 and this. And that's the way it goes. Like for me, I, I'm used to really working with living artists and, co and contemporary artists. And so I always see my role as a collaborator and a facilitator, um, not somebody that is imposing a particular narrative. I think that we all bring our own personal histories, our um, personal viewpoints to work. And so for this show and for the work that I do, it's really about this question of I'm setting up a situation in a sense or an experience and that you bring your own um, narrative to that. But for this particular show, I really saw it as a personal exploration. I was interested to see how I can impose, well, not impose, but how I could um, explore this idea as a curator who is interested in inst institutional critique to um, look at deconstruct the canon, I guess, so to speak, and um, how I can create a work that, f or a show that feels personal to me with work that I normally wouldn't be engaging with. And so, um, Within the work that I usually do, I'm interested in ideas around the identity of politics, around um, race, gender, about deconstructing those ideas. Um, and so it was, a, it was an interesting challenge 
to bring this exhibition together that is looking at this idea of where we are in the world and how we can engage within a global framework with these works. And so the title for the exhibition, it is from here that the world unfolds, is derived from a text from critical race scholar Sarah Ahmed, with a, who wrote a text called The Phenomenology of Whiteness, where she explores how white and non-white bodies are orientated in certain directions by their surroundings. And so I was interested in how the museum Again, talking about this on idea of, of the neutral and non-neutral, about how, um, how do we feel comfortable within, this, within the museum? You know, when I engage my friends, my family, other people I know to, to come see what I do, they're often not comfortable in this space. And I, I question why, like why you know, why is it that a museum is a place of sometimes of discomfort? And I think that deconstructing the ideas of, of how the museum has been envisioned, with, particularly within the West, is something that I'm interested in deconstructing. Um, especially, uh, I think that non-white bodies, due to this idea of historical exclusion, are really either invisible or hyper-visible within, within these spaces. And um, I'm interested in exploring how these ideas of hyper-visibility and invisibility are manifested within how we move through these spaces. And so the show and Sarah's text is about orientation, about our positionality about sort of recalibrating the idea of modernity, of how it's been taught and thought about and looking at alternatives um, of, pro of a proposition of thinking about modernity in a different, in a different way. And so I didn't want to create like a, a, I would say a linear chronological show. I wanted to look at the relationship between objects and create uh, an exhibition that looked at the relationship between objects, um, formal or otherwise, and how cultures, I think, from the beginning of time, from modernity, are really about this collision of culture, about um, collision of language and identity, histories and knowledge systems. And so um, this positionality is part of that exploration. Um, and so I was inspired by, let me see if this works. I think I asked these questions already. Um, and I'm also interested in a curator, as a curator in art that is engaged with social change. So some of these are some of the questions I've or one question I'm interested in is how does the museum become an agent for change in a changing world? And this is Sarah's um, idea around phenomenology, which is dealing with lived experience and positionality. And so I was interested in and I've been influenced by, I would say, three main exhibitions with doing this particular exhibition, one being Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum, which was at the Maryland Historical Society in 1992. Um, Wilson is primarily an, art, art, an artist, not really a curator, but this exhibition um, allowed him to go into a particular collection and kind of rethink it. And so he questioned how art and artifacts within that particular museum were presented. And so he switched up labels, lighting, he paired objects. And it's interesting, he also said when he went into into the historical society, he said, I had a kind of visceral response and I felt uncomfortable there. 
And so Fred took th these objects um, that were in the museum and he juxtaposed them to highlight different narratives about uh, the African American experience. And so, for example, he took these um, metal or silver vessels, um, tea sets, and paired them with um, metal shackles. And he also um, placed a Ku Klux Klan robe in a baby carriage. And the, um, the robe was placed into the stroller, which uh, the robe was donated anonymous, anonymously to the Historical Society. And um, it's particularly haunting, I feel, um, that this, you know, reiterating the fact that racism, racism is nurtured and learned. And so um, this idea of how he played with objects and just, juxtapositions of those objects is something that has been written about and talked about, like Fred changed the art world. That's, he's been written about that this particular exhibition really made us think about how museum objects have been displayed. Another exhibition that I had a chance to see was uh, Afro-Modern, which was at the uh, Tate Liverpool in 2010. It was curated by Tanya Barson and Peter Gorschleder. And it was an exhibition that was looking at this idea of the Black Atlantic which um, was a book that was um, written by a sociolo British sociologist, Paul Gilroy. And this exhibition was one of the first to trace the impact of black Atlantic culture on modernism. And so it was looking at the influence of African art and aesthetics on modernist art from the early 20th century until today. And so it was divided into seven chronological chapters, looking at avant-garde movements, such as the Harlem Renaissance, and all the way into this idea of the post-black. And it was really about opening up this idea of the transatlantic and looking at um, an idea of modernity as counterculture. Another artist who I've been influenced by is Arthur Jaffa. Um, this particular exhibition, a series of utterly improbable yet extraordinary renditions, um, which was at, in Berlin last year. And uh, Jaffa works primarily as a cinematographer. He does film and video primarily. He does Solange, Jay-Z, he's in with you know, hip hop artists and such. But he's, he's doing a lot of work around um, capturing imagery. And so he became quite well known for a video called Love is the Message, The Message is Death, where he um, took images from the internet, um, highlights from, you know, a lot of the, I guess you could call it internet, social media around um, black violence, um, but also a, about black joy. And so the video takes you on this kind of trip, this high and low trip around, um, around blackness and how it's represented in the media. And so for this uh, particular exhibition, he juxtaposes visual sequences with um, particular writers like Amiri Baraka, Jewish Butler, Fred Moten, you know, Mickey Mouse with this um, image of, um, I don't know if the, it's like a gang man member, but you know, he's really interested in this kind of juxtaposition of imagery and how uh, there's this real black back and forth um, and how media presents the black image. And he was also the recipient of the Golden Lion Top Prize at the Venice Biennial this year. Uh, I also had the opportunity very recently, last week, 
to see the reinstallation of, of the uh, Museum of Modern Art, which also is looking at um, how their collection is being presented. They were closed for several months for a rehang and a renovation. And um, $400 million renovation um, with the goal to exhibit their collection in new and interdisciplinary ways. And um, a lot of the pairings were similar in the fact that they're looking at the relationships between objects and not so much about this chronology. And so, for example, they had paired uh, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, which is in, has influence of African sculpture with Faith Ringgold's American People series from 1967, which is looking at the civil rights era and the struggles around that. And so these pairings are looking at, you know, for example, again, Chris Ophelia, who's a Nigerian artist with Henry Matisse, these kind of pairings that are about the relationship formal and otherwise, and not so much about these um, uh, chronological histories. And so, as you can see in Panabaker, I kind of started with this as the beginning of the exhibition, and you can see, I didn't put all the images on the slides, but you can see, the, it's better to see the work live. Um, uh, I'm interested in this idea of migratory aesthetics, this idea that was um, developed by theorist and video artist Mickey Ball, which is how um, through travel and through movement we can move into this other sense of space and I guess an alternative cartography in a way. And this migratory aesthetics disrupts this linearity of the Eurocentric model. And so the migratory, this movement, moves us out of the, the language of modernity. And so the ship ha is really a symbol of that. It's been talked about, even with Gilroy, as this kind of chronotope. He talks about it as um, a symbol of a space that represents this idea of movement, of how cultures are, and cultures are um, changed through how ships move through different countries brought through exploration and different ideas around that. And so Michel Foucault talks also about the ship as this heterotopia, um, where that carried imagination, not just items or people, but um, how culture moved through that. And so you'll see within this, in Panabaker, how I put together images and artists that are using the symbolism of the ship to talk about those ideas about movement and transformation of culture. And this is uh, an image by J. M. W. Turner, British artist, and Emil Nold, who is a German expressionist. And um, I was interested in, in Turner because particularly this work, which was created in 1833, which was the year that slavery was abolished in, in the UK. Um, and also, Turner was well known for um, creating this painting uh, called Slave Ship, where he is, which is about a, a real incident of a ship called Zong where slaves were thrown overboard um, for insurance. Long story, but. Um, I was interested in, in bringing that narrative of bringing to life issues and ideas around uh, alternative histories that we don't get to see and talk about. Um, I was also interested in the idea of bridges as heterotopias, as pace, places that are in between where culture moves through. 
um, objects that connect different spaces. And um, I was interested also in how different avant-garde artists were influenced by non-Western art. And so this is an image by Van Gogh, um, detail of a bridge in the rain after Hiroshi and the, the Hiroshi work is the one that's in the exhibition. And so this influence is important, I think, because there's always really a back and forth between Eastern and Western artists that I think kind of gets underrepresented. Um, I'm also interested in this idea of third space. I think that's what I wanted to create within this exhibition. Um, third space is an idea that um, really came to the forefront through uh, post-colonial scholar Homi Baba, um, who talked about this ambiguous space that is at the in-between. Um, and it's really a space, a liminal space between cultures. And so um, I wanted to explore that as a, a place where new subjectivities could come into being. And so um, artists that work in this third space look at, um, you know, this kind of in between ambiguity as a place to create culture. He had, a, he had wrote, written a book called The Location of Culture and he talked about this liminal space is where um, a lot of art is created and comes into fruition. And um, within the Panabaker Gallery, I wanted to um, be cognizant of the types of work that Levy was also interested in. He was a big collector of portraits. Um, and so I created a wall that is looking at portraiture. These two works are in the exhibition. One is by Charles Spooner of Queen Charlotte of Britain, who um, has been theorized as the first black British queen. Um, she was descended by Portuguese Moors, but in representations, different representations of her, I've seen her features change depending on who the artist is. Um, it, and then also I was interested in bringing this idea of um, othered bodies and making them visible within the space. And so Harold Gilman's Portrait of a Negro is part of that work. Um, the work was actually called Portrait, or recently changed, the title was changed to Portrait of an African American, and I changed it back. Because <laughs> I thought that it was important to recognize the history of that particular moment. Um, because, you know, I think, taking it into a different era, um, erase that, the reality of, of, of that work and where it was at the particular time. And so it's back to what it was. Um, and so uh, the other wall, this wall facing, um, I, was, I wanted to put together work that was exploring the idea of architecture and architectural space. And so the works along this wall are exploring that. Um, I was interested in uh, Kawamata's work because of its, um, well, it's an amazing work, but this idea of hybridity, of how he's exploring um, Japanese aesthetics, but also incorporating um, favelas, which are known as shanty towns in, in Brazil. They were created by um, um, descendants of African slaves in Brazil, made you know, basically from the refuse of um, those communities. And um, they, I think they take on an interesting connotation within the gallery space that they have this kind of fragility, but then also um, 
they kind of speak about a particular community, like about um, about forming that from basically from from nothing, and so um, I thought that that work was interesting to present within the space as well. Art and language is a um, collective that is more known for their um, writing, but um, based in, in the UK, some members from the US. Uh, I thought this particular work was interesting in that it's aware of itself as a painting, in that it deconstructs linear um, narratives, um, Renaissance perspective, when you actually see the work, it's, there's actually a real cutout in that space. And so it's, it creates a sort of orchestrated spectacle about museums, about art, and, and its place within that framework. And I thought that that was an interesting idea to present within the exhibition. And so in here, in this space in Sherman, um, I wanted to continue conversations around um, space, improvisation, structure. Um, I was particularly drawn to these works by Matisse um, from a, a series called Jazz. And um, I'm interested in jazz also as this kind of hybrid form about how it combines African and European um, aesthetics or rhythms, but also how the work is, um, can be reinterpreted, I think, for a contemporary moment. And so I was interested in having and using jazz as a metaphor for improvisation, for dissonance, for the, those ideas. Um, and this particular work is called um, Icarus. It's based on the mythological figure um, that you know, flew too close to the sun, right? Um, and this particular portfolio, um, is about, was made when Matisse was bedridden, he couldn't paint anymore, he was, um, you know, cutting, making these collages, and he talks about these works as violent, as violent as they are vivid. And um, he shows Icarus, the, the Greek figure, um, with a circle at its heart in this, you know, deep blue sky in a free fall, and it's a tragic moment of inevitable death, you know, collapse ambitions. Um, when asked about the picture, Matisse revealed that it was actually inspired by resistance fighters in World War II, as he was creating co the collages while living in occupied France. And the wartime coded transfiguration of Igoris uh, shifts this body from one of shellfire um, that's surrounded, I think, by shellfire. When you, knowing that, I, that the background of that work, um, and then also I'm reading it as well um, in a contemporary moment to the disproportionate impact of gun violence on on Black lives. And so I was interested in presenting these particular works because of. Um, the sort of dialectical struggle, I think, between form and shape and color. And so, um, also interested in this idea of circularity and rotation, bringing in works that um, echo that idea of repetition. And so moving away from this idea of the linear into the circular of the repetition of works that uh, explore those particular ideas. Um, so Kandinsky's Orange has those circul circular forms, even the Gilbert and George. Hetty has those circular forms again. Christo with his wrapped road signs. 
Vassarelli with the op art paintings that are about pure form and pure color. These are works that for Vassarelli he wanted to make for the everyday people. Um, also Anish Kapoor whose work is around the corner there. Other artists that are in this space are all artists that are interested in color and form and space. And so for me I was interested in um, projecting into the future about artists that are exploring this idea of outer space, of space, about thinking about how we can move through into another dimension, basically. Um, with Kapoor, I was interested in how he uses color, particularly how he uses um, black and blue. I don't know if you know the story of Kapoor's and his antagonism with other artists. Um, he's developed um, this idea, or not this idea, this formula with, in conjunction with a British company to um, patent this, the blackest black ever. And so it's called Vanta Black. Um, it was developed by Nanosystems um, for stealth satellites, and it doesn't reflect light at all. Um, and Kapoor is interested in these ideas of voids, black holes, um, of darkness, of um, voids of color, optical illusion, unlimited space. And so um, his particular work, Oblivion, I think, speaks to this idea of like limit, limitlessness. Um, and I think that, you know, he's an artist who I think you know, if anybody would be somebody that this idea of the blackest black would be, um, I would support his having that and not sharing it. Um, and so again, with uh, Nam Gabo's Monument to the Astronauts, Fuka Koshi's eerie figurative work, which is Moon on the Northernmost, um, he pairs these Catholic and uh, Japanese aesthetics um, influenced by the East and West. So again, he's t talking about this hybridity, this idea of spirituality and nature. Um, and so also within the background, we don't hear it now, but I also, as part of this exhibition, um, created a soundtrack for the show. Um, which is um, an experimental music or jazz by Sun Ra, who is a um, who was an experimental composer, and so the uh, the uh, album is called the Exper the Heliocentric Worlds of Sun Ra, and I thought that it would be important or interesting to have. Um, a soundtrack that echoed this kind of dissonance that was in the space. Um, Sun Ra, oh, sorry, I didn't even click through my things. Sun Ra, um, he's described as the father of Afrofuturism. He said he was came from Saturn. He created what was called space music. Um, he said black people were myths. He wanted to um, envision a utopian um, future where cyberspace was a place for um, rethinking different histories and imagining um, subjectivity through this technology. And so I thought that Sun Ra is somebody that has been, continues to be influential, I think, for artists and musicians. and. Um, his work still has resonance, um, as particularly for its you know, non-linear, um, for its mysticism and beyond. And so um, really this show is about looking at museums, considering how we um, organize our spaces, how we reflect on that, and how we move forward. And, the hope with this exhibition is that it's exploring, you know, these these systematic hierarchies and uh, as uh, find 
and is finding ways to break those down. And so um, taking us to another place to rethink how we um, present and think about art in the 21st century. So, all right, thank you. I think that's our time. Is it our time? Yes, all right, thank you.